Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this press conference on behalf of the International Monetary Fund. I'm Jerry Rice of the Communication Department. And the occasion uh, today is the release of our update to the World Economic Outlook. I'm very pleased that we have with us today the Managing Director of the IMF, Madam Christine Lagarde. We also have with us our Economic Counselor and Director of the Research Department, Gita Gopinath. And just to Gita's left, we have the Deputy Director of that department, who is Gian Maria Milesi Ferretti. So I'm going to ask the Managing Director to make a few opening remarks, followed by Gita, and then we'll come to your mm -hmm. questions. Thank you, Managing Director. Thank you very much, Jerry, and uh, thank you and good afternoon to all of you. It's very nice to, uh, to see many familiar faces and, and good friends and to be back in uh, Davos this year. It also gives me huge pleasure, actually, uh, to introduce to you, if you hadn't met her before or didn't know her or of her, our new chief economist, Gita Gopina. We're delighted that she has joined us and we're all extremely pleased uh, to work uh, together and I'm really honored that we are sharing uh, the, uh, the podium uh, today for you. I'm also very grateful to uh, Klaus Schwab and to the World Economic Forum uh, who are giving us a chance to present uh, the update to our World Economic Outlook uh, this year. And it will be my privilege to say a few remarks without giving you much by way of numbers because that is uh, the remit of uh, Gita and uh, Gian Maria. So, how many of you do um, cross-country skiing here? No? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Because I want to run the analogy of cross-country skiing for you. We, I'm not good at downhill, but cross-country, I'm, I'm OK. So what do you like when you're a cross-country skier? You like good visibility. No uncertainty. What else do you like? You like when it's kind of stable and eventually when it's a little bit downhill. You know, risks down, no hazards along the way. Yeah. Third thing you really like as well when you're a cross-country skier is everybody skiing in the tracks. Okay? Now move that to the global economy for a second. Last October, Assume we had started cross-country skiing in October. We downgraded our growth forecast a little bit. Risks were on the rise. We had bad news on the trade front, if not actually materializing, at least for some it was, but certainly threats. Well, I'm afraid that uh, we are going to announce a further downward revision of our forecast. So the cross-country skiing is going to be more laborious. More efforts will be required. And the bottom line is that after two years of solid expansion, the world economy is growing more slowly than expected, and risks are rising. But even as the economy continues to move ahead, as I said, it is facing significantly higher risks, some of them actually related to policy. And these risks are increasingly intertwined. Think of how higher tariffs and rising uncertainty over future trade policy fed into lower asset prices and higher market volatility. This in turn contributed to tightening financing conditions including for advanced economies, which is a major risk factor in a world of high debt burden. Now, does that mean that a global recession is around the corner? No. But the risk of a sharper decline in global growth has certainly increased. Add to this the uncertainty the geopolitical worries and disappointing long-term growth prospect, and you have an economic picture with a pretty clear message. And the message is the following for policymakers. Address remaining vulnerabilities and be ready 
if a serious slowdown were to materialize. Now, what does that mean? For most countries, it means harnessing the existing growth momentum, because yes, there is growth, in order to create more policy room to act. And the goal is to make sure that economies are more resilient, they are more inclusive, and they move towards more collaboration. So let me distinguish each of these three. More resilient. In terms of policies, it means reducing high government debt because that would open space that is needed to fight future downward. But this must be done in a fair and growth-friendly fashion. Monetary policy should be data dependent and exchange rates should be allowed to act as shock absorbers. Developing macroprudential tools will further financial sector stability and reduce potential vulnerabilities. This also remains the time for economic reforms in order to lift growth, especially in labor markets and infrastructure investments. That's what I mean by resilient. Inclusive. If we are to deliver on the promise of the digital revolution that will be much talked about in terms of productivity, in terms of employment, and in terms of long-term growth, then we must make sure that it delivers for all people. And that includes helping workers that are displaced as a result of transformations and automation. It means creating new and better opportunities for women and in particular for young people. This is the theme that I will address in various forums in the next few days. Resilient, inclusive. My third point is collaboration. Effective international cooperation comes down to fairness, to flexibility, and to a commitment for the common good. And that's where solidarity also means self-interest. I will develop that theme in the next few days as well. So what we need to do, all policymakers, all skiers following the tracks, we need to redouble our, our effort to resolve the shared problems that we are facing. From fixing the global trade system, yes, the G20 has called for that and it needs to be delivered upon, to fighting corruption and tax evasion, to addressing the existential threat of climate change. What's in it for the IMF? Well, the IMF needs to be in a strong position in order to help all countries. Because history suggests that somewhere over the, or the horizon, there will be unsuspect unexpected developments. The international community must come together to build a brighter future for all, I've called this a new multilateralism. And again, we will be developing that topic in the next few months as it applies to macroeconomic policies in all its dimensions and structural reforms as they need to be applied in many corners of the world. Those were my messages. I'm going to disappear and leave the floor to our most eminent economists starting with our chief economist, Gita. floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Managing Director. Um, so I will flesh out a little more what's in the outlook. While global growth in 2018 remained close to post-crisis highs, the global expansion is weakening and at a rate that is somewhat faster than expected. This update of the World Economic Outlook projects global growth at 3.5% in 2019 and 3.6% in 2020, that is 0 0.2 and 0 0.1 percentage point below last October's projections. Now, the downward revisions are modest. However, we believe the risks 
to more significant downward corrections are rising. While financial markets in advanced economies appear to be decoupled from trade tensions for much of 2018, the two have become intertwined more recently, tightening financial conditions and escalating the risks to global growth. We have revised downwards our forecast for advanced economies slightly, mainly to, due to downward revisions for the euro area. Within the euro area, the significant revisions are for Germany, where production difficulties in the auto sector and lower external demand will weigh on growth in 2019. And for Italy, where sovereign and financial risks and the interconnections between the two are adding to headwinds to growth. The US expansion continues, but the forecast remains for a deceleration with the unwinding of the fiscal stimulus. Across advanced economies, we foresee growth to slow from 2.3% in 2018 to 2% 2 in 2019 and 1.7% 1 in 2020. This softening growth momentum has provided little lift to inflation. While core inflation is close to target in the US, where growth is above trend, it is significantly below target in both the Euro area and Japan. Economic activity in emerging and developing countries is also projected to tick down to 4.5% in 2019 with a rebound to 4.9% in 2020. The projection for 2019 has been lowered from October, mainly because of a large projected contraction in Turkey, amid policy tightening and adjustment to more restrictive external financing conditions. There is also a significant downgrade to growth in Mexico in 2019 and 2020, reflecting lower private investment. The projected rebound in 2020 is due to an expected recovery in Argentina and Turkey. The outlook for emerging markets and developing economies reflects the continued headwinds from weaker capital flows following the higher US policy rates and exchange rate depreciations, even though they have become less extreme. Across emerging economies, some of the pickup in inflation reversed towards the end of 2018. Overall, the cyclical forces that propelled broad-based growth since the second half of 2017 may be weakening somewhat faster than we expected in October. Trade and investment have slowed. Industrial production outside the US has decelerated and purchasing managers' indices have weakened flag flagging so softening momentum. While this does not mean we are staring at an imminent major downturn, it is important to take stock of the many rising risks. An escalation of trade tensions and a worsening of financial conditions are two key sources of risk to the outlook. Higher trade uncertainty will further dampen investment and disrupt global supply chains. A more serious tightening of financial conditions is particularly costly given the high levels of public and private sector debt in countries. In other risks, China's growth slowdown could be faster than expected, especially if trade contentions continue, and this can trigger abrupt sell-offs in financial and commodity markets, as was the case in 2015-2016. In Europe, the Brexit cliffhanger continues, and the costly spillover between sovereign and financial risks in Italy remain a threat. In the US, a protracted federal government shutdown poses downside risks. Given this backdrop, Policymakers need to act now to reverse headwinds to growth and to prepare for the next downturn. The main policy priority is for countries to resolve cooperatively 
and quickly their trade disagreements and the resulting policy uncertainty. Rather than raising harmful barriers and further destabilizing an already slowing global economy. The call of G20 leaders to reform the World Trade Organization in Buenos Aires must be accomplished. Where fiscal space is low, fiscal policy needs to adjust in a growth friendly manner to ensure public debt is on a sustainable path while protecting the most vulnerable. Monetary policy in advanced economies should continue to normalize carefully. The major central banks are keenly aware of the slowing momentum, and we expect they will calibrate their next steps in line with these developments. Macroprudential tools should be used where financial vulnerabilities are building up. And across all economies, measures to boost potential output growth and, en and enhance inclusiveness are imperatives. Lastly, given that policy space for countries is more limited than in 2008, multilateral cooperation will be even more important in the event of a sharper decline in global growth. And it is essential that multilateral institutions like the International Monetary Fund have adequate resources to deal with the rising risks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kisa. Let me turn to some questions in the room. If you could please uh, identify yourself by name and affiliation, then we will uh, try and take as many questions as we can. Uh, let me begin with uh, Lady down front. Can you hold on for the microphone? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Julie from iPhone.com of China. Uh, my question to Gita. Um, What's your expectation on Brexit deal and the, in, its impact on the global economy? And what's your suggestion to the leaders of EU and uh, Britain? How to break the deadlock of Brexit deal if the second voting is failed? Thank you very much. A no deal Brexit is one of the major risks to our forecast. Uh, our forecast uh, incorporate um, a smooth transition, that a deal is actually made, uh, and that there is a smooth transition to the new setup. But if there is a disruptive uh, exit, or if there is continued uncertainty for many more months, both of those are going to weigh negatively on growth going forward. Uh, and I think it is uh, imperative for the leaders to resolve this uncertainty immediately. Thank you. Uh, Bloomberg in the second row here, if you can wait for the mic. Thank you very much. Eric Martin with Bloomberg. I wanted to ask about the modeling for some of the trade scenarios that you mentioned and the downside risks from the trade war in particular. What would be the consequences for the global economy of an end to the current truce between the U.S. and China on trade? Uh, we, that would be an upside risk. Um, we had uh, looked into this very closely in the October uh, WIO. Uh, and Sorry, an, an, an end to the current truce, that things worsen from where they are now. Oh, so things worsen. Okay, well, then that would certainly be a, a, a worsening of the outlook. The, um, when we did a, a, a major uh, update in last October uh, following the trade tensions, uh, the assumptions were that uh, the higher tariff rate uh, on Chinese imports, uh, on sorry, U.S. imports from China, the 25% higher rate, would come into play. Uh, so if, uh, on the plus side, that that isn't the case, then that would be a positive upside risk. Uh, but if, in, on the other hand, if it is a, a much more serious deterioration uh, in the trade tensions, then that would be a much more significant downside risk. Okay, I'm going to swing down to the front. Lady in the front. Yes, ma'am. Sylvia Mata from CNBC. Hello. I have a question about China because we received the new GDP figures earlier this morning confirming the slowest growth rate since 1990. How worried, about, uh, how worried are you about China and whether this will transition into a wider global growth slowdown? Thank you. 
uh, the, Chinese, the numbers that we saw for China today are actually completely consistent uh, with our forecast. So our estimate for 2018 uh, was 6.6%, uh, which is exactly where it uh, came in. Uh, so what that means is that we're certainly not seeing any big rise in a faster pace of slowing down. Uh, this is consistent with the level of maturity of the Chinese economy, uh, the rebalancing of, of China's economy. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, I would think of it as a positive uh, reinforcing of the fact that China's growth, while slowing, which is to be expected, uh, nothing dramatic is, being, is happening at this point. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to take the other side of the room here. Yes, sir, in the front row. I think it's Arabic News. Hi, thanks. Uh, Arab News. Um, um, Frank Kane, Arab News of Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, just on the, on, on the oil price, your forecast less than $60 for the next two years is rather more pessimistic than uh, m many others. Uh, can, you, can you say how you got to that figure? Yep, uh, you're right about the numbers, and I'm going to hand over this question to Gianmaria. So uh, our forecast for the oil price uh, is based on futures prices. Uh, and that is what futures prices uh, indicated at the time we finalized uh, our forecast. That is a broadly horizontal path for oil prices from uh, staying below 60, between 55 and, and 60. So that is what underpins our uh, forecast. Uh, El Pais in the third row, lady in the third row, please. Hello, Alicia Gonzalez from El Pais. Um, uh, I've seen the differences you made in your assessment for two economies with new governments. Uh, it is Mexico and Brazil. Uh, why do you see a deterioration in one hand for, for Mexico and then you, you have a more upset assessment? for the Brazilian economy. Is it for the reforms or the policies announced? Thank you. Uh, for Brazil, uh, we are seeing continued uh, growth, and these are coming a lot from cyclical factors, uh, which is a recovery from the downturn. And so that's a cyclical uh, expansion that we are, we are incorporating uh, in there. Uh, there are still. Uh, risks to Brazil's outlook too, in the in the sense uh, that very high levels of debt for Brazil remains an issue. In the case of Mexico, the downward revisions are because of uh, policy uncertainty and the dampening effect we expect that has on uh, private sector uh, investment. And I'm going to let John Maria jump in here if he has, would like to add anything. Uh, Yes, I would just add that for uh, Mexico, we see a somewhat weaker momentum coming in 2019. Uh, so that is one factor uh, also contributing to our down revision. But I think it's important when one compares the two to uh, understand that Brazil comes uh, out of a very deep uh, recession in 2015-16 with v uh, very uh, moderate growth uh, since then and had needs more room to, to um, uh, close the, uh, the output gap. Mexico come from a period of not spectacular but more stable growth. Thank you. I'm going to take ITV way at the back. Uh, hello there, Joel Hills from ITV News. Uh, Gita, in Britain, we are obsessed with the British uh, cliff Brexit cliffhanger, as you put it. Um, I wonder what your view is. What is the biggest risk to the British economy? Is it slowdown in China, or is it disorderly Brexit, in your view? Uh, the immediate risk uh, would have to be Brexit. Uh, the uncertainty associated with what the outcome is going to be come March I think has to be the dominant uh, factor. And how much longer can this uncertainty continue before it damages the economy? We've already seen the negative effect of this uncertainty on British investment. Uh, we have done our estimates of what it would be, how costly it would be to the British economy to have uh, a no-deal Brexit, which would be a reversal to WTO uh, rules. Uh, and that would be a decline in long-run uh, output of about long-run GDP of between 5 to 8 percentage points. 
So those would be quite significant. Uh, it is absolutely essential that this uncertainty is resolved sooner than later. Uh, goodness, that's, can I just thank ask you. a no, supplementary? Thank you very much. Jerry, on that. I'm going to turn. Uh, lady uh, next to you, please. Hi, Isha Nelson from Quartz. Um, I think one of the things that's noticeable about this year's World Economic Forum is the political leaders that are missing because they're dealing with national crises at home. You briefly mentioned the sat shutdown. Obviously, we just talked about Brexit, but I wanted to introduce France as well and the Yellow Vest protests happening there. And just ask, how much longer do these particular instances have to go on before you start to see measurable impact on the national economies and then also the global economy? Thank you. Political risks are clearly uh, very important. Uh, and in France, uh, we actually reduced our estimates, so we uh, revised our forecast downwards uh, slightly, but because of the Yellow West uh, uh, protests that we had towards the end of uh, last year. Uh, I think what is important, you know, instead of waiting for an escalation of these political risks, is for leaders to immediately take actions uh, that prevent such. Uh, such you know, uh, unhappiness with the way uh, things are working out for some sections of society. And these are real genuine concerns uh, that, need, uh, that need to be addressed. OK, thank you very much. Uh, New York Times, please. Uh, Keith Bradshaw, New York Times. A question on LDCs. Are you concerned to see rising foreign debt among many of the poorest countries at a time when there are also concerns about falling commodity prices as the world's uh, economy slows and also we see less and less of that debt covered by Paris Club. Thank you. What our report highlights is that there is actually a, a great deal of heterogeneity in how uh, LDCs are doing. Uh, so it is not one story for all LDCs. Uh, and that is heartening, uh, given that actually there has been a fair amount of financial turmoil uh, in 2018. Now, it is indeed the case uh, that for some countries, uh, the fact that they still have high debt levels, uh, and we are, uh, you know, financial risks are one of the major factors that we are flagging in this, in this report. It is an important concern and is an important downside factor. For commodity prices, 2018, the, the, the initial part of 2018 was good for commodity exporters. Uh, and actually, we, that increased our estimates for 2018 for some of those countries. Uh, but going forward, with commodity prices coming down, uh, that, is, uh, that is a negative impact for those economies. Thank you very much. I'm going to take uh, two more questions. Uh, one at the very back. Gentlemen, yes, sir. You can hold on for the mic. I'm Ihab, Ihab al Ogli from Al Jazeera News Channel. Uh, you just said about, you expected that the price of the oil would be between 55 and 60. Uh, what do you expect uh, that impact on the uh, GCC countries' uh, uh, economies and the growth in it, especially Saudi Arabia, which is considered one of the uh, most uh, exporters of, uh, uh, from the Middle East? And what's the impact on, uh, on the other countries uh, that uh, um, are in relations with the uh, GCC countries in the Middle East, like North Africa and all the, those countries? Um, I mean, the, the, the decline in oil prices and the projections for oil going forward certainly uh, weaken growth for major commodity exporters, uh, including uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm going to let uh, John Maria add to that yeah so the indeed the the downward revision for Saudi Arabia's uh, growth forecast for 2019 is 0.6 percent comes from uh, 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 the decision to uh, uh, rest restrict oil production taken at the uh, OPEC uh, plus meeting in December um, so it's reduced uh, a bit reduced oil uh, output growth and that is the reason for the revision there are other fa offsetting factors, but not strong enough. So um, fiscal policy has become more expansionary in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but uh, so the non-oil part of the economy is uh, picking up uh, a bit more. But uh, on uh, in the aggregate, uh, there is a negative impact because of the redu reduced production of oil. You mentioned spillovers uh, to uh, uh, other countries, of course. 
typically if you have a slowdown in uh, GCC countries, you will see uh, somewhat lower remittances uh, that affect uh, some of the countries that send a lot of workers to the region. At the same time, some of these countries may be oil importers. So while they get lower remittances, um, think of Pakistan or Bangladesh, uh, they would also benefit uh, on the other side from uh, reduced outlays for uh, oil purchases. So the net impact uh, in some cases for importers is going to be positive. But again, this remittances channel is an important one to uh, take into account. Thank you, John Maria. Okay, I'm going to make this the last question, so I'm going to take uh, the gentleman here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Cameron with China Central TV Business Channel. So I want to know what's your take on China's tax cuts, especially the latest round, which is the personal income tax cuts, which aims to free financial burden for middle and low income groups. Will those rounds of tax cuts serve to cushion more some downside risk and increase domestic consumption in, in, the, in the year of 2019? Uh, the tax cuts for chi uh, that China uh, implemented along with the um, loosening of uh, reserve requirements, uh, both of those are factors that cushioned, in our opinion, the negative impact of uh, trade uncertainty, the trade tariffs, um, and which is why there wasn't, we haven't changed actually our forecast for, for China going forward since October. Uh, so we think of both of those as uh, having played a useful role. Uh, we, however, continue to flag that it's important for China to, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, ring fence its financial uh, sector to make sure that uh, credit growth is sustainable. Uh, that there is financial regulatory reform, uh, and there's still a rebalancing of the economy away from industry towards services. So that has to continue to be the medium-term, long-term goal for China. Thank you very much, Gita. Thank you, Jan Maria, and thanks to all of you. We'll see you in the course of the coming week. Thanks. <laughs>